The meetings have been become quite famous. Uh, the Mont Pelerin Society is often, uh, th this specific meeting said, people who are critics of neoliberalism would say, this is where all of that neoliberalism stuff got started. And they, and claims are often made that I think are, are not accurate about what sorts of things took place at the meeting. So I wanted to, for scholars or anyone else who might be interested, uh, show them what actually took place, what sorts of discussions took place at that 1947 meeting. And it's, in addition to that, it's a lovely uh, meeting because it was all of the people who one would identify as being important in liberalism in the 20th century were there. So I'm Bruce Caldwell I'm from Duke University. I'm the director of the Center for the History of Political Economy there and a research professor of economics. So Friedrich Hayek is an economist. Uh, he was born in 1899 and died in 1992. And he was born in Austria, but he moved to the London School of Economics in the 30s and 40s, and then moved to the University of Chicago on the Committee on Social Thought in the 50s and early 60s, and then he moved back to Central Europe, both uh, Germany and Austria. Uh, he is an economist who's worked on various areas within economics. His uh, initial work was in monetary theory, so he had a, a famous conflict with John Maynard Keynes, who later became actually rather a, a close friend uh, when they spent time together in Cambridge during World War II. Uh, he also is famous as a critic of socialism. It's a socialist calculation debate. And in the process of developing his ideas in that debate, he also uh, talked about the uh, the use of a market system or the ability of a market system, a well-functioning market system, to uh, coordinate behavior in a world of dispersed uh, information or dispersed knowledge. So he's actually made multiple contributions, uh, capital theory as well. So within economics, he's, he's done a lot of different stuff. So Hayek had, had a number of contributions outside of economics. Uh, he, during the war years, turned away from economics to a project that he called the Abuse of Reason Project. And he was trying to understand why uh, the world was turning towards both totalitarian uh, uh, systems of the left and right, uh, fascisms and, and uh, Soviet communism, but also uh, what the intellectual roots of that were. So he, he very much drew on the intellectual history of the 19th century into the early 20th century to try to explain that. So intellectual history is one of his contributions. Uh, in the process of doing that, he wrote what he said, this is a political tract, was The Road to Serfdom, published in 1944. He was worried then about the way that the world was going uh, after after the Allies would win in World War II, what, what would be the nature of, of the political and economic setup subsequently. Um, he also did a book on theoretical psychology, The Sensory Order. This actually came out of some of the writings that he did in that Abuse of Reason project. The Scientism essay talked about uh, some ideas about uh, limits of approaches to social scientific phenomena. And it was, it, it, it bred in him an interest in psychology that actually dated back to papers he had written when he was a student in Vienna in the early 1920s. After World War II, he was very concerned about the future of liberalism. He wanted to try to articulate the, uh, a, uh, the foundations of a liberal society, what, what sorts of criteria could one use to identify uh, a, a well-functioning liberal society. So the Constitution of Liberty and Law, Legislation, and Liberty are two contributions in that area. Uh, so he, he made uh, contributions in, in a lot of different Places, that's one reason why I find him such a fascinating figure. Uh, in order to study his work, you really have to take a deep dive into, into disciplines outside of economics. So I've been working on Hayek since the 1980s, but um, in the 1990s, I decided to try to do a book on Hayek's methodological contributions. I found his uh, insights into the limits of economics as a science to be uh, quite important, and that's what I wanted to pursue. In the process, I did a couple of volumes in a book series that the University of Chicago Press uh, puts out called The Collected Works of F.A. Hayek. And when my book, Hayek's Challenge, uh, was getting ready to be published, I was approached by the, the person who was the editor of that uh, series, the general editor, Stephen Kresge, 
and he said he was getting ready to step down, wondered whether I would be interested in taking over the general edit editorship of the Collected Works project. This was in 2002, um, and I've worked diligently on it uh, since then as the general editor. The general editor, uh, as general editor, I did some volumes myself, but I also solicited other people to be volume editors. A volume editor would uh, produce uh, both a text that was a correct uh, reproduction of the text of the originals, but also add explanatory footnotes as well as an editor's introduction to try to put the, the work in context. And that just was completed, the final volume of that, there's 19 volumes, was completed in 2022. So I'm very happy to have that project after 20 years uh, finally completed. It was started actually in 1988, The Fatal Conceit, Hayek's final book was the first book in the collected works. So it's a project that, that really extends <laughs> however many years it is from 1988 to 2022. That's, that's how long it took to, to complete it. If we were trying to gain lessons from Hayek, specifically the lessons that I learned doing the book Hayek's Challenge, as I said, uh, that book focused on his economic methodology. And what Hayek thought was that when dealing with essentially complex phenomena, which is what he thought would be true in the case of the economy and also of the brain, which is one reason why he was interested in doing the sensory order, that uh, often the best that we can do is offer explanations of the principle by which things happen or make broad pattern predictions, but not specific predictions. Under the influence of positivism, my first book was on uh, philosophy of science and economics, uh, and it was titled Beyond Positivism. Under the, the, uh, the principles articulated by philosophers of science who are in the positivist era, uh, the idea is that you must make precise predictions in order to be a science. You must be cumulatively progressive in your ability to do that. And I rejected all of that. He said, no, you, you, there are real limits to the social sciences and we should recognize them. The way to be scientific is not to pursue an, an image that works for some sciences, but not for others. So um, if we were to try to generalize some of the ideas that come out of that, that set of insights, if we, if we believe them, then it really means that, uh, that we should uh, perhaps be more than just pursuing economics with a vision of trying to come up with, for example, ever more precise predictions. I don't think economists necessarily are doing that today, but certainly having a knowledge of the past, of the struggles that economists uh, had during the 20th century in terms of trying to figure out what they were doing and, and how to do it better. Uh, the, the history of economics actually gives you a pretty good insight into that, not just studying specific figures like Friedrich Hayek, but a numbers of figures uh, that struggled with how best to do economics as a science during the 20th and now the 21st century. For a while, for most of my academic career, I've been an intellectual historian. And my book, Hayek's Challenge, was, was that. It was mostly an intellectual history. But when I became the general editor of the Collected Works, in order to become the third general editor of the Hayek Collected Works, I had to meet the Hayek family. So I went down to Devon in southwest England and met Christine Hayek, his daughter, and Larry Hayek, his son. I, they needed to interview me to make sure that I was a person that they uh, accepted as, as becoming the next general editor. They were great people, fascinating people, and very open and sharing. I had a long conversation with Christine separately and then uh, with Larry. I, I stayed at Larry's house, slept in one of their bedrooms. Uh, after the interview, uh, we had dinner, uh, you know, sat around and, and, and had long discussions. And the next day, Larry brought me up to his study and showed me an enormous cache of, of interesting memorabilia from his father's life. Everything from his skis to collections of photographs that he took when he was 16 years old. Uh, going with his father through the mountains, uh, photographs of orchids, uh, playbills, uh, maps. I thought these were maps for his skiing. They were maps that were from World War I when he was a soldier in, on the Austrian front. And uh, he gave me free reign to look through these things. And it, it was always the, the idea that whoever was going to be the editor of the collected works would also be Hayek's biographer. So. He had interviews that Bill Bartley, the original uh, editor of the Collected Works, had done with his father. He had uh, a summary of some of these interviews that Bartley called the inductive base. Uh, Bartley was a 
ph philosopher who had studied under Karl Popper, and the inductive base was what Popper, that was a phrase he used to say, here are the, this is the set of facts from which we're, we're trying to uh, develop a theory. So I just said, there's a massive amount of material here. They're, they're willing to, uh, to allow me to access it. And then as I went along, I realized they had family letters, all of this stuff. So um, it, it, I, it, I was hooked the day that I walked into Larry Hayek's study. And that was when I thought, I really want to do this. Now, one of the, one of the things that Hayek had always required of anyone who wanted to be his biographer was, is that they're fluent in German, which I'm not. So I, I actually took a, 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 a course, a college course for a semester in German, just to see if I could pick some things up. And I picked some things up, but I knew that was not going to work. So uh, luckily, one of the people who had been uh, a volume editor, Hans-Jörg Klausinger, lives in Vienna. Uh, uh, so he's Viennese, just like Hayek, uh, and obviously fluent in German, and, and had done a marvelous job on the two volumes that he had done. So I approached him and asked him if he wanted to, to collaborate with me on the, on the biography. And this was about 10 years ago. So this was a, ten, a project that was 10 years in the making. It's very different to do a biography because you are talking about the person's life. You're getting to know his family. I did uh, numerous interviews with Christine Hayek, a person who was just lovely, lovely person, very sharing. Uh, very uh, straightforward, honest, uh, you know, doesn't sugarcoat anything. And it was, a, it was a, a really different sort of project that I, I think we both warmed to uh, over time. So that just came out in uh, November uh, 2022. So tw 2022 ended up being a, a very big year in terms of the things that I did uh, uh, on Hayek, both the completion of the collected works and may I, I, I think I'd like to mention one other project that I did. And as luck would have it, I have it right here. Okay. So this is Mont Pelerin, 1947. Uh, one of the important things that Hayek did outside of his intellectual contributions per se was he was very good at building institutions. And the Mont Pelerin Society is a society that in 2022 celebrated its 75th anniversary from the 1947 first meeting. And this is, uh, the, at that first meeting, Hayek's secretary attended. Uh, she took uh, notes on what was said, it, not a verbatim transcript, but there was a transcript from uh, what took place at the meetings. And the meetings have been become quite famous. Uh, the Mont Pelerin Society is often, uh, this, this specific meeting said, people who are critics of neoliberalism would say, this is where all of that neoliberalism stuff got started. And they, and claims are often made that I think are, are not accurate about what sorts of things took place at the meeting. So I wanted to, for scholars or anyone else who might be interested, uh, show them what actually took place, what sorts of discussions took place at that 1947 meeting. And it, it's, in addition to that, it's a lovely uh, meeting because it was all of the people who one would identify as being important in liberalism in the 20th century were there. Uh, Frank, from the Chicago School, Frank Knight was there, uh, George Stigler, Milton Friedman, Aaron Director, uh, among ordo liberals, uh, uh, Wilhelm Rupke, uh, Walter Eucken was there, were there, uh, Lionel Robbins, his uh, uh, colleague at the London School of Economics, uh, philosophers of science like Michael Polanyi and Karl Popper. Uh, it w the list goes on and on, let's just put it that way. Maurice Allais, a Nobel Prize winner from France. So it was it was a wonderful meeting, and of, and of course, <laughs> the Austrians, uh, Ludwig von Mises and, and Fritz Machlup, and they they fought with each other. They had disagreements about what they thought the future of liberalism should be. So it was really quite a lovely, uh, lovely set of of, uh, of transcripts. And I, an another thing that came out in 2022. So 2022 ended up being my a very good year for me, as the saying goes. Hayek a life which has just come out in 2022 is volume one of two. It runs from 1899 to 1950. And whereas before most treatments of Hayek have been of his intellectual contributions, when you try to do a biography, you're putting together what he was doing at various points of time and what might have been some of the things that took place in his life that may have had an influence. So really what we are trying to do in the book is to see the world through Hayek's eyes. So this is a person who's raised in Vienna, in a, 
not he they, the family was not rich, but they were on the other hand von Hayek. So they, though not wealthy, they mixed in an intellectual milieu. Uh, this was very influential. He he was a bad student in a bad school system, but he was a great mind. So he was bored by the school system, but. His father was very good with all of the three sons in terms of kind of giving them education, particularly in the natural sciences, to go out collecting everything. Uh, he came uh, educationally of, a, of age in a way when he went to the University of Vienna right after World War I, where he served at the front uh, in World War I on the, on the Italian front. And uh, at the University of Vienna, it was a time that mass politics, so, the franchise had been expanded, but a lot of the parties that existed were horrible. You know, some of them were, uh, uh, there was a Christian socials, and they were often uh, quite anti-Semitic. They had Aryan clauses. Uh, the socialists were not anti-Semitic, but they had views that he rejected. Uh, and the third sets of parties all were ger german oriented because the Austro-Hungarian Empire had lots of different uh, nationalities in it. and. So a lot of the ones that were that were uh, trying to uh, uh, participate in electoral politics were, after World War One, when the the empire had been broken up, were emphasizing the German elements, and they were it, two of the three were uh, explicitly anti-Semitic, and the third one was uh, was was socialist. So I mean, it was he actually supported a very tiny party that didn't go anywhere. It basically disappeared within a year. That was, uh, that was secular, um, that was not anti-Semitic. It was pro-German, but not anti-Semitic. Uh, and it was liberal, kind of reform liberal, kind of in his early years, he would be closer to someone like Keynes in terms of the, his views. And it wasn't until afterwards when he met uh, uh, Ludwig von Mises that he became much more of a, a classical liberal. And uh, uh, yeah, a, a Democrat. He was, the, their party supported universal male-female suffrage at a time that not all places were, were doing that. Um, so it was, uh, it was, knowing his background actually helps one to understand where his ideas came from. And I think that that's important. And, and the kind of constraints, and it's, it's actually also just a fun story because he lived through such intense times. Um, just if you think of the European history of the 20th century to see that. The second volume will look at 1950 to 1992. So um, there's lots of things that took place during during that period, uh, politically, economically, stagflation <laughs> of the of the 70s. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize at that time, so became a public intellectual. He increased his connections to various foundations uh, uh, in the United States primarily. So uh, exploring all of those sorts of things, the, the, the influence of the Mont Pelerin Society uh, t t tended to increase. And we went from the Keynesian era to what might be called an, a, a more liberal era uh, under, in, in the 1980s. And he was you know, he, corresponding with Thatcher. And, you know, so it, it, will, it will be fun looking at, looking at the second, uh, second phase of his life. If we reflect on the on the long arc of, of Hayek's life, he started out as as an economist, although he had interests outside of that. Um, but certainly by the 40s and 50s, he started to say, if you're going to understand social and economic phenomena, you have to understand economics, but it's not enough. And he always would say that. And I think what he meant there was that you know, the narrow study of economics without a, a, a broader appreciation of other social sciences, of the history of the field, of the various approaches that might be taken, uh, you're not going to be able to do good economics. And there's lots of ways to do economics badly. Um, and that has consequences for society. So you want to, to approach your discipline with a certain amount of humility. And I think that that was something that I think one could take away from, from Hayek's ideas. Just speaking personally as, as, a, as a person who's, who's been an economist uh, for now 40 or 50 years, 1970, so wherever, however many years that's been, um, yeah, some of the, the, the best lessons I've learned was simply by teaching something like Economics 101, where you're trying to make the ideas about economics quite 
clear and plain to someone who's not an economist, to talk to people who are not economists. That's really a, a, an important lesson that young economists might be able to, to take away. So I, one thing I would say to young economists, if we were trying to imagine what, what kind of lessons you might take from this, uh, this little episode, is, uh, is first of all, try to teach <laughs> when you're in grad school and get some exposure to teaching non-economists uh, uh, the, the, the principles of economics. But I have to also say, uh, you know, I am the director of the Center for the History of Political Economy. I have an interest in promoting the history of the discipline. I think it's important for economists to know that. Uh, take advantage of, of the programs that places like uh, our center offer, and there's lots of them in other places too. Europe has a number of different uh, uh, possibilities for people to gain uh, insights into the history of economics and its methodology, various methodological approaches that have been uh, uh, tried among uh, in, in economics in the past. Uh, these are these are good things to uh, to at least uh, uh, what your what dip your toe into at least see if see if maybe you might find it something that is uh, congenial to your to your tastes.